has a really incredible story, and here she is. Just about it, why you're here. Just like what you already did. <laughs> Okay. Okay. So um, this is my piece. It's a self-portrait, and I don't think it's your typical self-portrait because, from what I know about them, they're usually pretty darn detailed. Um, every facial feature, hair, uh, whatever else, to the T. And as I was getting caught up in those details, I realized that none of them actually mattered, and that I wanted my self-portrait to, instead of be a physical representation, be more of a, um, what's the word I'm thinking of? Yes, an abstract <laughs> representation. And um, I, I chose to kind of work with three main um, things that happened to me in my life that have really formed me as a person. Um, the first one was uh, when I was a really young child, I guess I should say a baby, I was ran over by a car, which left me with uh, burns on 30% of my body. And um, I think that sort of growing up with those kinds of scars as a child, it kind of makes you either become a victim or become a stronger person. And I was lucky enough to deal with it in the stronger person way. <laughs> and um, it really, uh, I think it gave me the confidence to kind of succeed in life and have that little kind of grit that you need to uh, face life. Um, the next part was my Portuguese heritage. I'm a first generation American. Um, and uh, Yes, first generation American. My parents um, came here in the 1960s and I think uh, if anybody else here is a first generation American, you know that that can be tricky growing up as you try to be American but your parents really, really want you to pretend like you're not. Um, and so the basketry and the co copper and the wire was supposed to kind of represent the, my heritage. And then uh, the most obvious part of me is the piano um, mechanism that is the entire part of me, I would say, like maybe my, my core. And uh, that is literally what the piano is to me in, in this day and age. I, um, it's my passion. I, I work it. I, I use it. I, I work it. <laughs> it is my job. It is my creative release on, on top of collage and assemblage. And uh, it's pretty much my life. So those were the three things that I chose to represent myself with this piece here. So thank you and I hope you enjoy it. Thank you so much. Um, and I just had a question for Heather. This has become a really popular event and exhibit, and I'm just wondering why you think the Object Afterlife Challenge resonates so much with Eugene. Because it's different, and it's really, really, really fun, and it's inspiring to see scrap being turned into something different. So it's different in that it unites the worlds of scrap art and fine art, and so that's kind of the principle behind us, and it's our driving mission is that creative reuse. So taking something, for example, this was created from pots of colored sand. So taking something that's just sand and turning it into art. And we don't have any other shows like that in town. Plus we have 60 people applied to, to do it. So it's, it has a huge following and we're really, really proud of it. Um, this is our sixth year doing it and we really love it. Thank you so much. We have about um, 10, 15 minutes till we're on to our next stop, which is I think Raven Frameworks. So, and just remember, try to keep the wine inside. Also, I just want to point out that there is a local celebrity here, either this year's Slug Queen or Slug King, whatever you want. Thank you. Oh, I'm sorry, the next stop is the Lincoln Gallery.
I'm Renee Mitchell. This is my Object After Life submission. Come down to Mecca and see what we're doing. Thanks. That's a detail of it, and, and we'll revisit this piece a little later in the talk. Uh, that's an example of kind of when I'm most <coughs> successful about using parts for a sculpture that are sort of about what the sculpture is about itself. Joe, this Joe, I've got a request from the peanut gallery. Can you talk a little louder? Sure, yeah, yeah, sorry. Um, I'll, I'll try to spin a little bit of uh, I, I didn't need a microphone because it was a big cavernous room I thought I could project. This is me at the office. I work in a 2,000 square foot warehouse out in West Eugene. Um, I, have, I, I work there by myself without assistance and collect all kinds of scrap materials and put them together to make various kinds of sculptures. This is my co-worker, the pig. This is us on our way to work, so the pig comes with me every day to and from work. You know, he's got his role there, I've got mine. This is, you know, we've got a yard there so he can move around and do stuff. Once in a while we have safety meetings. <laughs> it was a controversial topic raised, I'm not sure what it was. But, you know. And mostly the pig just naps in a big bed there in the office and is the office manager while I do the work. <laughs> so this is uh, John Grab in Salem. And part of you know this this world that we live in produces masses of all kinds of stuff, consumer stuff. We just make a lot of stuff and a lot of it gets thrown away. And for me, as a visual person and an artist, it's a really interesting sort of playground of materials. I mean, the, this, I can find repetitive forms, I can find forms that I wouldn't be able to draw because I'm not that great at drawing, and put them together in ways that achieve uh, an outcome that I'm looking for. Um, so I spend a lot of time hunting around places like this just for my bread and butter materials. This is a motorcycle shop in uh, West Eugene called Cycle Psycho. Um, <laughs> They basically take apart old motorcycles and sell them as pieces. Longtime friend of mine, and he lets me go through his scrap bed and take or, or buy kind of whatever I want to use for parts. So I spend a lot of time there gathering the parts for the, the repurpose work that they do. He's very well organized. I can find kind of whatever I need in great quantities. Those are motorcycle spokes that I end up using for ribs of a fish sculpture that I'm working on. Um, really great source for me. And yeah, I just sort of collect shapes. Some of it I don't know how I'm going to use it. Some of it is automatically this piece has got to be a rhinoceros horn. I mean, the rhino out there, basically they gave me the horn shape and said, isn't this cool? And from there, a whole rhino needed to be built around that shape. It was so perfect for a horn. And then I go back to the shop and basically need to be able to take them apart into usable materials for whatever piece or you know, shape that I need. And so at my shop, I need to be able to take almost anything apart and put almost anything back together. And there's a variety of tools to use to do that. Um, just cutting metal with either torch or a grinder. But I, I, it's scary. I mean, some of these tools can take a finger off immediately. So I have little reminders around the shop that 
it's all fun and games until somebody me cuts a finger off and just to keep myself cognizant because you do this stuff over and over again. Here's my, my OSHA approved. <laughs> <laughs> I'm up to, I think, eight days on the accident street now, so it's really good. Um, I'm a terrible weenie about pain, so accidents for me is even a little blister with a hot glue gun or just anything at all that might hurt. Uh, and you know, you burn yourself a lot with sparks. So here's welding on the fish sculpture that I'm working on right now. That's what the motorcycle spokes are for, as far as being ribs. I do a lot of arc welding, gas welding, sort of whatever. <coughs> tool is going to really help me put the stuff together. My primary uh, steel, if I'm welding it, it's probably steel. Steel is the most easily weldable material. A lot of the junk in the drum air is steel. It's just the most versatile thing to use. But I have a variety of other ways to put things together. Spark and preserve is cool. Um, so this is where I sort of left off. This is the piece that was in the mayor's show last August, uh, Vacua Imperium, which is bad Latin according to Bob, for the, the empty empire. Um, and and it's, a, it's a part of a series that I've been doing of these sort of hallucinatory factories. There are these little tableaus that hang on the wall of burned out sort of industrial factory settings. And they have all kinds of detail and ladders and places that look like people should be doing stuff, but they're completely empty and devoid of people. And, and part of the idea about that is just the, the sort of the loss of industry and that sort of manufacturing <coughs> job in this country that our parents, our grandparents used to do, that was really some of the cogs of our our society here, and that's all moved overseas, a lot of it has, and um, there's a whole lot of reasons for that, but just to take a piece and look at um, how do you show that visually, and then ironically, the pieces that I used to make this are pretty much made overseas, so this sculpture is made out of the very thing that it's talking about, it's part of the problem it's talking about. <laughs> Different view of it. Um, so after that, I, the, there it is at the mayor show, and there it is at this little tag. And that was, that was a huge honor and meant a lot to me to win the Dustin show last year. Thanks. Yeah. <laughs> This is a continuation on that same sort of, theory, uh, of series of the factories, and this one is in three dimensions. It's in the round, it's uh, called the Tower of Babel, and it's about five feet tall, and really, um, just I wanted to make a factory that was fully round and not a wall hanging, but I also wanted to play with uh, the Disney castle, and sort of just vaguely visually at the Walt Disney castle there at Disneyland think about like what does that thing look like from the inside all the industrial just stuff and guts and ugliness that it makes to make this really pretty fan on the outside but let's strip away what does that look like and so that's part of what this sculpture is about and these are really fun to make i mean you just get lost in the tiny detail of you know um, making something so intricate yeah, and it's hard to get a good photograph that shows all of what's going on in here, all the little passages and kind of tunnel shapes. So this, along with, a, there it is with me to show sort of a perspective. So this, along with the piece that was in the mayor's show and two other pieces were asked to be displayed in a show in South Korea. So I, I in the fall of last year, got to box those things up and send them to Seoul, South Korea. They have a national museum there that wanted to put on the first ever steampunk show and do sort of <coughs> bring steampunk to Seoul. And, and they did it big time. They had a good budget and paid for the shipping for 30 artists to get you know all kinds of work there. So it was a huge show. Um, probably the shipping to send these pieces to South Korea cost more than the pieces are worth themselves because some of these crates were telephone these size. That's one of the other pieces that went, one of my mechanized trilobite shapes. Um, so sometimes creating these things is as tricky as making the sculpture itself, just making sure that it doesn't you know, break. And, and shipping companies are notorious for not being nice to things that they're moving, so you really got to over, overpack them. The steampunk show in South Korea just really, they advertised it on buses. Uh, they did a really, really nice catalog. It was like surprising how large the show was and how seriously they took it and funded it. It's now going to probably move to China. So the Chinese government has expressed interest in showing it and exhibiting it. So those four pieces will probably move there next. 
This is the, their museum has an opera house. Uh, it's just an amazing sort of Smithsonian level institution. And for it to embrace steampunk and this sort of modern assemblage art was really uh, exciting to a lot of us. Where did you go? No, no, I, I didn't. Ahead of time, I didn't know how large of an event it was going to be. And you know, they'll pay to ship the art, but not the person. <laughs> I, you know, if I had told them I had great stuff to lecture about, sure, possibly. But um, no, I didn't go, and, and often it's just not worth it to go in terms of the time I've missed in the studio. This is a piece I made uh, last fall that's called Nava Durga, and this was for a show in Portland uh, where the guy really wanted to do sort of controversial art. So he was asking the artist to push, you know, buttons as far as it being controversial. And that seems like sort of not a very challenging theme for an art show. But I had wanted for a while to do something that showed um, the, just the different religions as sort of unified around the idea of mortality and sort of the beauty of that, that shared certainty that you know, religions set out to try to answer that big mystery we've all got in common. And they have different ways of answering that. And they've set up whole wars around those different answers. But at the base, it's, you know, there's a real connection and a unity there that we don't really pay much attention to or embrace. So I'm um, just trying to make a piece that, that looked at um, taking the, the symbols from the eight most popular religions in the world and putting this together, and then making something up here that was just sort of a unity shape, not anybody's particular shape, but the idea that they could come together under sort of a one note. It's about six feet tall. It's a life-size skeletal model. Um, yeah, about six feet tall, six feet wide. It's on wheels. It's a good-sized sculpture. And this is an example of something I made because I was really interested in the idea, and it was close to my heart, and it's also very unsellable. Not nobody really, really wants that in their living room. And when you start putting religious symbols next to other religious symbols, you're guaranteed to piss some people off. <laughs> Did you find the skeleton in a junkyard? I found the skeleton on a medical model supply catalog. So, yeah, I mean, it's, it's plastic, and uh, early on I would use real bones, which are kind of dirty, and I mean, not real human bones, but just real animal bones, but there's real practical hesitations to that. Uh, I tried casting on my own bones in aluminum, but that was a lot of work and heavy and more expensive. And then I realized I can get plastic models and make them look like just about anything cheap and effective and quickly. And that's what I meant about shortcutting to you know, being able to get the idea out there. Uh, this is sort of a similar, smaller version of a piece that I've done a couple of years ago. A guy that has collected my work in the Netherlands. He's a, a famous DJ. If you follow electronic house music, I do not. Uh, I had never heard of him, but apparently he's got money to buy things like stalls of flowers. And so that's something I need to remember. This is Jim. He's called The Prophet. Again, I don't know who he is, but I'm happy that he likes my work. <laughs> This is a piece that the city of Eugene uh, worked with me on. So they have a new award called the Bold Steps Award. And Bold Steps is their sustainability and recycling program. Every year they're recognizing a business that is really practicing sustainable values and recycling. And uh, Katie Pierce, our lovely mayor, gives it out at the State of the City address every January. And they needed some sort of trophy kind of thing to go with it. So I worked with the city to do uh, this, Bold Steps. It's just a spiral staircase um, design. It's made out of um, redwood that was from the Cuthbert Amphitheater. So because it's a recycling award, it made a lot of sense to use recycled metals. And, and then to ask the city, do you have some sort of recycled material we could repurpose for this? And so we used uh, redwood from the, the Cuthbert Amphitheater to do both the pedestal and the little step there for the that. This year's winner was Glory Bee Honey, a lovely company. Of just, uh, so they have that award for the next year, and then it will be passed on to whoever wins in the 2015, sort of like a stand cup of recycling. <laughs> <laughs> and there it is being given out by the city of the East Bay. It's really great there. Uh, this is a shelf that I did for some friends of my wife and I who live in Portland. She needed something for her office and something for her kitchen. Had seen some other work that I'd done in a restaurant and just asked for a real functional basic shelf. And this is sort of an example of, I mean, to make a living as a sculptor, sometimes I'm doing the fun stuff that is meaningful to me, and sometimes it's the stuff that's going to pay the rent this month. And, and a shelf like this is, is fun to do. 
but it's not as creatively stretching as some of the other stuff that I like to do. Um, this was the one for her office, had a lot of mirrors and sprockets, a lot of stuff from the motorcycle shop. Um, and then this was the one for their kitchen. <laughs> These are about probably six feet tall. They're they're a good size, good size pair of shells. Then I wanted to do a baboon. So I mean, I, sometimes I just pick animals because they appeal to me. Either the horn of the rhinoceros or the baboon's ass. Or I, 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 I can't account for why certain things appeal to me. The heron and the funny bend of their neck I find beautiful. Um, so this is just the starting point of a sculpture. Uh, it's basically looking at Google Images and finding a bunch of baboon pictures and then proceeding out to make a baboon. This is the studio. This is a bear that I'm still working on, but over here is the beginning of the baboon. Um, where I cut stuff up to be able to just add it back together. Here is the beginning of the baboon. It really is built around this gas tank of a motorcycle that serves as the chest cavity. And, and belly, and then a, basically a stick figure of metal to be structurally strong because all the stuff I'm putting on the outside of it is recycled. Some of it's rusty, some of it, you know, you don't really know how strong it might be. Um, so you need to have it underpinned with something that truly is strong enough to be repaired. I don't take a lot of pictures as I'm working, so we went from stick figure to almost done baboon. And I, I apologize, I just usually I'm busy doing the welding or the, the work. I, I don't do a lot of in process. Photos, uh, the, the I went to the motorcycle shop and said specifically I need something sort of orange and baboon buttish and gas tank that was just perfect, so I cut part of it off and that's the best And there it is, pretty much flashed outside of the Here's this, this formal senior portrait. <laughs> It's, it's pretty much life size. Uh, I, I, you know, I didn't know that much about baboons until I started looking up images and realized like they're really vicious animals that kill a lot of smaller animals and have claws and teeth. And so I really needed to sort of draw out the, the intimidation look on of him and make him look fairly severe. And I, you know, this is an example like, okay, so it's a motorcycle shock absorber and I want it to look like a muscle. So it still retains that idea of, you know, taking force and being shock absorption for a motorcycle, but it's also functioning as the baboon's, you know, bicep sort of thing. So that's, that's a nice balance for me. I, I was sort of afraid of them. <laughs> And so then he gets boxed up, and my gallery that uh, is out of London, Wolf Gallery, goes to international art fairs. And so probably a dozen times a year, big cities have at their convention center art fairs, and they invite maybe, well, they don't invite, galleries pay a good amount of money to go and be part of these art fairs. And there might be a hundred galleries sort of under a big top tent to do an art fair. And the biggest one in the U.S. is Art Miami, Art Basel, and that's where the baboon ended up going. And, and fortunately, he sold there. Um, so that's a great, you know, it, it helps to pay the rent and keep me doing what I'm doing. Um, but it's also a really strange event to be collecting junk motorcycle parts in Eugene, Oregon, and sending them to this rich art fair in Miami that pretty much the 1% or and their friends are going to to, to buy art. I mean, it's, it's truly upcycling to... to <laughs> <laughs> Cost to ship the baboon? Uh, I think it was about 450 bucks. And the baboon sold for 9,000. So and the gallery takes about half of that. And I mean, he earns his part. And, and you pay as the artist to ship it there. And the gallery pays to ship it back if they're not able to sell it, which makes them motivated to try and sell it. Yeah, but it's it's a big it's a big event, and my, my wife and I went to one in West Palm Beach, Florida, a year and a half ago, and realized this is something to go to one time, and then you let the guy for the gallery stand here all weekend and sell the art and talk to the rich people because this isn't very fun. <laughs> <laughs> There's some cool art here. But something that a fisherman in Maine asked me to do. He wanted a shark of some kind, and so just had a real specific idea, said I've seen, he'd seen some of the other mechanized fish-looking things that I've done, and just said, can you do it as a shark? 
I absolutely had fun doing this. Um, almost nothing on this is actually metal. It's mostly wood, plastic, model parts, you know, um, camera lenses for eyeballs. It ends up at the end looking like metal just because I, I want to give it that effect, but almost nothing on it is actually metal except for the fence. <coughs> This is an Ouroboros, so uh, I've done a couple versions of this. It's a classic symbol of the snake eating his own tail. It's called the beginning of the end. Um, a radiologist in town had seen a version of this and really, really wanted one. Uh, it is probably the most tedious and painful kind of work for me to do because it's just welding snake spines over and over again, 50 or 60 of them. Um, but you know, it, it pays a bill. This was a fun one to do. A friend of mine uh, has a husky dog and just said, can you do our dog and found objects? And I had never really tried to do a pet portrait and I had dreaded the idea of pet portraiture. <laughs> <laughs> but good friend and sort of interesting challenge, like, well, can I do the found object and just drum stuff that I'm doing but really make it look like, you know, this family pet? And they have a young daughter, so it, it needs to not look uh, mean like the baboon did. It needs to be a nice dog. <laughs> That that challenge, a little smile there. <laughs> <laughs> and just again, precise reference. What you use for the white parts on the dog? Uh, like a picnic table, sort of a uh, yard porch table, sort of mass produced, thin. Um, yeah, it, it's crappy metal to weld, but it's very easily findable, and it was the right white color for the black and white of the husky. Because the color was more important on this one than it is on some of the things like the other things.
Halloween. My okay. name is Jessica and I coordinate the art walk. So if you have any questions, comments, complaints, it's me. Talk to me. <laughs> the art walk happens year round, so that means every first Friday. Come out and see us. All of these galleries are open to bring you art. We're also having a special art walk next month. It's a U of O art walk and all of you are welcome. Um, it's on October 2nd, which is Wednesday. So it will be a Wednesday art walk at the U of O and then the regular first Friday art walk still. So two art walks, a lot to enjoy. Um, we're gonna welcome now the host, Karen Rainsong, who is the managing director of the Arts and Business Alliance of Eugene. And she's also representing the sponsor, Eugenia Gogo. All right. Do you want to talk more on that, Karen? Sure, thanks. Hi, everybody. Welcome to the First Friday Art Walk. I'm so glad that all of you could be here at Mecca to start off our Art Walk tonight. And we're really excited that the clouds are holding back and not raining on us tonight. Yay, let's hope that continues. Yeah. Thanks so much for coming out and being here. Um, the Arts and Business Alliance of Eugene is a nonprofit. And in case you haven't heard of us, I'll just mention what we do is we help to form partnerships between arts and business to help wonderful events in the community come to life and be supported. So we help nurture both those sectors, arts and business. And one of our projects is the Eugenia Gogo website. You may have heard a little bit about that or seen it around. That is a free online arts hub for artists, venues, anyone interested in the arts. You can go there and peruse the calendar, check out what's happening all around town in all of the arts. And if you're an artist, it's a great way to connect and collaborate with other artists and get found by venues who are interested in showcasing your work. We're going to hear a little bit more about that later in the next venue. So thank you very much for being here. And before we begin our interviews, just a couple little housekeeping things. We are going to be moving from here to our second stop, which is the Eugene Piano Academy, which is just right across the street, right over that way on 5th and Willamette. And from there, we move to the Jacobs Gallery, just down Willamette. Then we're going to head on over to Full City Palace Bakery. And our final stop tonight is Goldworks Jewelry. So if you can make it for most or all of the walk tonight, that'd be great. Just follow on right along. And when you're walking, do check out. Out there, we've got the Emerald City Roller Girls rolling around, and they would love to say hi to you and hand you something about Eugenia Gogo. So, you know, it'd be great if you would take it. <laughs> Take one for the team, right? <laughs> All right, great. Well, I would love to introduce now the executive director of Mecca and a wonderful friend of mine. She makes so many wonderful things possible here at Mecca. She's just a powerhouse of energy and talent, and I'm so lucky to know her. So this is Miha Andrade. Thanks so much, and thank you all for being here. Welcome to our Object Afterlife Art Challenge Exhibit. This is our fifth year doing this art challenge. And what's so wonderful is that at the end of the art challenge, which is a multiple month process, we have this exhibit, which is a culmination of all the creations of the participants. And the way the art challenge works is that we do a call to artists in the spring. All participants are asked to fill out a short application. Based on their application, we select materials for them from Mecca. They do not know what they're going to get. When they pick them up, they have two months to create a piece of artwork using the materials they're given. They can um, incorporate any other mediums, they can use any other materials, and they can alter what they're given in any way. They just have to use something they were given. So you will notice the pictures next to the pieces. That lets you know the materials that they were given, and then you'll see the pieces themselves, and then you can see how they actually use the materials. So it's very inspiring. We get a lot of great feedback about this show. It's very unique. We love that we can do it this time of year when we also have the Mayor's Art Show and the Salon at New Zone. And so we will also be talking to um, one of our participating artists, Lori Macedoni, who's been participating in this every year Good since year. the beginning. Wow. So, And for those of you who don't know about Mecca, um, it stands for Materials Exchange Center for Community Arts. We're a nonprofit arts education and reuse organization, and our mission is to help divert materials that might otherwise be thrown away, make them available for creative reuse in the community, and also to um, encourage uh, low-cost arts experiences and education in the community as well. So with that, I am going to turn it over to Lori. 
Oh, well, I'll let you interview me. Is that what oh. you're going to do? I'll just talk away. I'll talk away. That's fine. My piece is in the middle of the room here. It's the lamp that is covered with 672 glassine bags that I colored, figured out how to fold into triangles, and stitched together to cover this uh, lovely St. Vincent de Paul find of the lamp. <laughs> I will credit my husband with painting the base of it a uh, more organic color. And it, uh, I did actually ask Miha in my application that I really like working with vintage and I also really was hoping for multiples of whatever she was going to give me because I've learned in the past that when you get one thing, you've got one thing and if you make, it a, make that decision and cut into it or slap paint on it, you better hope it's going to work. <laughs> so at least with uh, multiple, you've got some experimentation that you can do. But she went a little, a little over this time. I, I ended up getting 2,000 of these old glossy bags, and I thought, I would like to have a project that would use as many as I possibly could. Um, I ended, use, ended up using 672, ergo the title Illuminata 672. Uh, I also should pardon me. Tell us about the texture. The texture. Well, first I colored them with uh, Adirondack color wash uh, while they were still in this shape, and then I folded them, ironed them, folded them, and then I have a texturizing machine uh, that has all different uh, designs. Each color has its own design, and the light looks differently when it's turned off than when it is turned on. It looks more watercolor quilt-like when it's turned on. When the light is off, it looks, you can see the textures of more, more detailed that way. Um, I would like to thank DirecTV for giving me free movies for the summer. <laughs> I sat there and colored and folded and colored and folded and cranked and folded and colored and folded. The easy part was stitching, the easy part was stitching them together. Uh, that really only took about 10 minutes and my only rule was no two colors would be connected to another color. Uh, of the same. So I just had a blast doing it. It was actually kind of zen-like in a, a bit as, uh, as I constructed it, not knowing which way the chevrons would be going. It was just a matter of trusting that, you know, to try this, try that before I actually glued things down to make it permanent. <laughs> So it is not for sale. I decided to give it to my stepson and his family uh, for their new home and for the new grandchild I'm going to have in March. All right. All right. Thank you. And does anybody have any questions for Lori? Show us what you started with again. Show us the bag again. There it is. It's Tiny a glassine bag. bag. It's very strong. It looks like wax paper, but there's no wax to it. It is a non-porous uh, material that actually protects what's ever inside. It's, um, it, like yeah, it comes in They're often used for that stuff. would for protect stamps. artwork. Yeah. Thank you, Lori. Quickly, did you open them to fold them? I yeah. I took it this way. I cut one edge. I opened it up. Okay. Folded it down and made a triangle out of it. Oh, great. Thank you. And when I had discovered that, then I went, well, now what am I going to do? With it? <laughs> did you use the spray? And when I saw the lamp. It kind of came together for me. Did you use spray adhesive as your glue, or did you use a liquid? I just stitched it and attached it at the top and so the bottom and a few places in between. Lamp. Wow, great. You hot glued it on the lamp? Um, 
What kind of glue? I think I used yes glue. Oh, okay, great. Thank, Thank you. you. Miha, would you like to say a few words about how long the show runs and what the hours are of Mecca? Sure. So uh, this exhibit will be up through the end of September. And Mecca is open uh, Tuesday through Saturday. Tuesday and Wednesday we're open from 11 to 6. Thursdays we're open from 11 to 5. Friday 11 to 6. And Saturdays uh, 11 to 5. Oh, I'm sorry. Thursdays 11 to 9. Saturday 11 to 5. So some of, our, some of Mecca's programs are, besides the gallery, where we have an exhibit um, every month or every other month. We also, this store, this store is um, also a studio where you're standing is normally an, a studio that's open to the public. You can come here and shop for uh, reuse art materials. We take donations of materials that are no longer useful to you from businesses as well, like scrap materials, old samples, um, uh, production waste, things like that, or household items that are, are um, non-recyclable, those sorts of things. You can always check our website, which is materials-exchange.org, to find out more about us. And there's lots of um, literature at the front desk where you can, if you want to take something away with you. All right, great. Thank you. Thank you so much, Miha. And do grab an Art Walk program on your way out there by the cash register, and we'll be moving on to the Eugene Piano Academy soon. But please take a look at some of this art before we... Oh, one more thing. Somebody left a water bottle back on the table. Water bottle back in the corner. Yeah, yeah. 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 Water bottle back in the corner. Yeah. I just wanted to also thank Miha for helping me become a visual artist the way that I have through the art chicks. And I'm going to... I I just... Uh, I have gone from a performing artist of singing with telegrams, send a song singing telegrams, a lot of people know me from that, to a visual artist, and I really, really uh, love you for helping me do that. And um, last year, the um, project is called Body Type. I'm now a new Zone member, and that is there on display. If you get around to the New Zone Gallery tonight, be sure and stop in and see that one too because that one I'm really proud of. Thank you. Both great work, Larry. Thank you. All right. Thanks. There's no button.